Hey everyone, how's it going? Better late than never, as they would say. As sometimes they would say. Thank you guys for waiting for me. I had a technical difficulty uh, with the computer. That sometimes happens, I guess. I don't know how to deal with it. Um, basically, uh, so you guys know, because I'm sure some of you are curious, I had to run some, uh, some antivirus software and make sure some things are okay before I got started. So I want to make sure everything was okay uh, because I have been super busy this week. Super busy. <laughs> uh, <laughs> boy, was I, uh, did I underestimate all the projects this week? Um, so we'll get into that. There's some cool stuff to get into. There's a lot of stuff to talk to. I'm sure you guys have questions, of course, to talk about. Um, and uh, and uh, a couple things. Uh, I got to make my speech, right? Hey, if you're new to this show and this is your first time watching, uh, if you're uh, live, please ask a question or make a comment with a question mark first if it's for me, so I know you're talking to me. If you're watching the rebroadcast, I take the time to timestamp all of the stuff down below. So it's all the subjects we talk about and, of course, uh, any questions you have. And uh, also, if you want to stream this as a podcast, you can listen to it on Spotify, SoundCloud, iTunes, iHeartRadio, you name it. It's out there as a podcast. Uh, and because you guys, it's growing faster and faster. I don't know if I told you guys. I don't know what this means, but I thought I'd share it. Uh the uh, the iTunes uh, sent me a thing saying that in my category of of, of of podcasts, I'm number 14 in the United States. Um, and in Europe, I'm like number six. Um, and I think the category is, um, what category did it have? Like how to, it's the how to category. That's what the podcast falls under is I, I guess we're a how to channel uh, is what they claimed or categorized it as. But uh, at first, I didn't know what that meant, and so after doing some investi investigating, it means that, uh, yeah, there are channels like How to Fix Your Car and How to Fix Your House, and this is How to Fix Your Guitar, I guess, as well. And we're beating those guys, <laughs> which is crazy because we're such a small small guitar community, and we're beating them by uh, by streams and downloads. So uh, very cool. Thank you guys for that. I appreciate it. Um, the, uh, the iTunes money is just flowing in. <laughs> That's a joke. iTunes doesn't pay you. Uh, so anyways, uh, but still, still worth it. Gives me something to do on, keeps me, keeps me out of trouble on Fridays. So I feel pretty blatant with my, look at my new mug. For you guys listening, I'm pointing at the new mug. I wanted to try, anytime there's new merch, I wanted to try it. So I got a new, new mug. And uh, there you go. Uh, I reason I'm bringing that up is I obviously I was reading some of you guys' comments when I was waiting for this virus protection software to finish scanning and stuff. And, uh, Somebody said, I like the old logo better. The old logo is not going anywhere. If anything, uh, maybe I, I'll explain it and hopefully you guys will understand. This logo, and for those listening, I'm pointing at the logo that looks like a blue body with a uh, bronze headstock. This is Know Your Gear. Uh, I'm wearing the shirt too. This logo was originally made for me and only me. And I, I made it available to some of the patrons, or at least I made it available to patrons. And then somehow, like on a live show, or something happened, and I, oh, my wife, uh, and this one she made for me personally, this shirt. But uh, the shirt I had, she did on Teespring, and some of you guys bought it. And it was never intended for you guys to get. <laughs> In fact, uh, it's, it's, a, it's official now. It's official, so I can say it. This is a Know Your Gear. Uh, this logo is a guitar. It's a good, yeah. <laughs> it's a guitar. For you guys that don't know, you layman's out there, this is what a guitar looks like. No, this is going to be a very soon video, a custom guitar uh, that I, I can't say I built it, but let's just say I'm, I'm putting it together. This was a, this logo is part of a guitar that I have. It won't be for sale or anything. It's just was supposed to be something for me. So if you have the blue guitar logo, Essentially, consider yourself just originally it was supposed to be just for me. And and now you just have a logo or a shirt and mug that I had. Um, why? Because I was getting sick of the stick figures. I love that logo. I know you guys do, too. We sold so many shirts. By the way, I should bring that up. One of those do those you very YouTuber thing. Just so you guys know, 20% off on all shirts today while they're live show. Actually, it's for the week. Um, why? Because I wanted to, and the sale is 20% off at the merch down below, but the uh, the code is uh, 2020 sucks. <laughs> so there you go. If you want to buy any merch between now and it will cover it until next weekend. I think I put it in on like the Monday in two in basically two weeks just if you want to buy any merch 20 percent off 
I don't know why. Actually, it's because I was, yeah, I just had time to do it. So I did it. Um, all right. Um, uh, Tyler Laflamme, what's up, buddy? He says, did you buy another Gretsch anniversary? Uh, why would you think that? Just because there's one there? Yeah. Um, uh, not, I talked about it. It was at the end of last week's podcast. I went into very long detail about it, Tyler. And so, you know, um, Tyler, if you want to check that out, it's time stamped. So that way I don't have to recover uh, it here again. But yeah, you can learn all about it. I tell the whole story. I didn't mention you in the story, <laughs> but, uh, you know, you get the idea. All right. Okay. So, uh, what else is going on? Oh, uh, well, I want to talk about, uh, of course, Guitar Center's bankruptcy again. And there's a reason why, even though last video I did it, I said, I'm sick of talking about it. I am sick of talking about it. I put a link today. They, they have somewhat announced that they are filing bankruptcy as soon as this weekend. And this is why I want to talk about it. It's, uh, it's a, a very important Believe it or not, I want to share some important stuff with you. First of all, I'd like to point out that I, this is, like I said, my third or fourth time on the podcast talking about Guitar Center's bankruptcy. And I've said this many times. It's just been Guitar Center's been this looming thing forever about, you know, how they're going to handle it. And I've always said over and over and over again that I feel like if they file bankruptcy, they will file Chapter 11. I'd like to point out today that they have officially announced that they are uh, trying to file for Chapter 11. If you guys don't know, last week, last week, a couple of weeks, uh, episodes ago when I said chapter 11, somebody said, no, it's chapter nine. It is chapter 11. I was right. Uh, and I could have been wrong, but in that case, I was right. I, I was pretty sure because chapter 11 is a large debt uh, bankruptcy. They are, uh, they're trying for chapter 11. This is why I want to share this information with you guys, because it's important. And I consider you guys my community and part of this community. And I want to share some information that I have that I think might be helpful for you. And, um, Here's what it is. Uh, so in the chapter 11, what they will do is they will try to reorganize. So the, they're also saying that this is Guitar Center to some degree is stating that their creditors are working with them and they think this is going to happen. Now, so, you know, I've said this before, the bankruptcy courts will decide whether or not they get chapter uh, seven or 11. Seven is where they just they're gone like Toys R Us. It's all over. But 11 is a reorganization. OK. What does that mean to you watching this channel right now? And that's what I want to share with you. Uh, uh, we know what it means to creditors and we know what it means to certain other people. But what does it mean to you, to us, to the guitar players, the consumers? Well, I want to now switch gears, if you please, if you switch hats, if you will, to my opinions. This is opinion based right now. And I want to be very clear. This is just an opinion, but it's an opinion I would give my, my closest friend. I'm giving it to you the same way. Um, that means they're in a reorganization. A couple things can happen. First, some other company can swoop in and buy them. I don't think that's likely, but it's possible. Um, the, the other thing is the, they're going to have to make a proposal like Gibson did to the courts and say, this is what we think is going to fix the problem. We want to pay these creditors this much. We want to change things. We want to shut off some things. This is my opinion now. I think, and I've actually, and I want to preface this with this opinion with, I've talked to I can't say who because he has to be anonymous, but let's just say a someone in the industry that would definitely know and understand something about a store that size um, agreed with some of the things I said, interjected a few other things, but either way, it was the same mindset, which is I believe they're going to close between 50 and 100 stores. Uh, what they'll probably do, and again, this is my opinion, it's, a, it's a, my forecast, right, as you will, but there's a reason why I'm sharing it with you. I think what's going to happen is there's a couple problems. First, they're going to take all the stores that are not profitable. Where I live, there's five guitar centers. Not all are profitable, I'm sure, but who knows? Maybe they all are and they stay. But I think they're going to shut off some uh, non-profitable stores. I want to... Um, uh, so that's what I believe they're going to do. I think that's going to be a smart move for them. But there's a couple things I want to tell you guys. Now, that's my opinion. Here are some things that are not so much opinion. These are facts. A lot of people have made speculations that Gibson and Fender will go in the stores and take merchandise back. That is not going to happen. Uh, the bankruptcy courts, once you file for bankruptcy, you're immediately under bankruptcy protection. The courts will decide how everything happens, everything. Uh, the bankruptcy court is the law, and they will um, uh, 
basically they'll decide what happens. Okay. And so remember when Gibson filed bankruptcy, originally they wanted Henry to keep running the company and the bankruptcy court was like, no, <laughs> right. Cause that's, what's going to happen. The bankruptcy court can go. Yeah. I think your plan's good. You can keep going with the company as long as this is the plan going forward. Or they can say, um, uh, I'm sorry. I'm going to pin a question real quick. Okay, guys, because I think it's uh, ties in. Hold on. Remove that. And let me pin this question. I apologize. How do I unpin it? I just rest <laughs> There it is. Okay, so I just don't want to lose this question. So anyways, so what's going to happen is the bankruptcy courts will decide what was going to as what's going to happen with the liquidation or any of the liquidation or any of the adjustments that are going to happen. I don't want to say liquidation. Um, so what I mean by that is the creditors can't go in and just get their stuff or their money. The bankruptcy courts will decide what happens. Like I said, they're they're trying for a chapter 11, which is a reorganization. Things that I think are going to happen with that reorganization, like I said, they're going to close 50 to 100 stores. Now, I, let's say I'm wrong and they close five to 10 or none. I think that's not very likely. In today's market, I think if you have a store with a heavy lease that's not doing well, I think it's a good time to shed that kind of stuff off. We've seen Kmart do that same thing. Now, why this is important is usually what that means is they're not going to transfer a lot of that inventory, at least not the used open boxed inventory to another store. They'll most likely transfer the closed uh, merchandise, sealed merchandise, or none of it at all they'll liquidate. So what I'm advising you guys, if you, if you not that to worry, but um, you gotta understand there's a lot of Fender, there's a lot of Gibson, there's a lot of guitars and product in those stores. And if they do uh, shrink the size of the Guitar Center, there are gonna be some deals out there on some product. So be prepared for that. So if you're looking for certain products, I maybe wait to see if Guitar Center's got a deal on those stores closing out on you. Uh, so that's something to think about. The other thing you have to worry about now, and this is just good common sense, I would uh, stay away from buying any gift cards from them and having any in-store credit. Now, again, I'm gonna keep repeating this because I know people can confuse. They are not trying to file chapter seven, which is where they dissolve the business. They are trying to reorganize the business. And so therefore in a reorganization, the credit lines that you have, the credit card, or not credit cards, the, uh, the gift cards and the lines of credit should still be good. But of course, that's on you if you're gonna trust that. I wouldn't trust it uh, for all. I could tell you for a fact, I think, uh, my wife had a gift card uh, for like 200 bucks to Circuit City that obviously is no good. Now, keep in mind, Circuit City did file Chapter 7. But but why I'm telling you this is, again, these are opinions. And I have no no base of fact on this. Just an ex, uh, just want to say expertise. But let's just say I'm very aware of how this is going to, this could go. Um, the other thing that can happen is if the courts decide that Guitar Center cannot reorganize reorganize at 11 and go 7, then yeah, they could actually do what Circuit City did and just say, hey, we're not accepting gift cards anymore. So again, I'm not saying not to, to patronage Guitar Center farthest from it. I'm just saying I wouldn't want Guitar Center to owe me anything right now. I'm sure, actually, I'm not, not even going to guess. Uh, for a fact, I have many friends I've said before that own companies that Guitar Center currently owns, owes six figures to right now. No exaggeration. So I can't get in trouble for that because it's an absolute fact. In fact, I've heard the word bastard so many times on my texts from friends that own companies that own Guitar, that own guitar Center O's. Uh, I, I've never seen the word used so many times by so many people to describe the same company. So they're a little upset, of course. They're losing out some money. So, uh, so anyways... Uh, there you go. So there you go. So so be aware of the fact that they can do those. Uh, you know, that's the situation. So I would be aware of that if I was for you. I did, like I said, put a link uh, down below. Like I said, Guitar Center is saying that they'll probably uh, try to file this weekend. We'll see. Um, again, everything can change. Anything can change. Like, remember, like I said before, they could always get that equity swap at the last minute. Because remember, the creditors might decide at the last minute, hey, screw it. We want to, we want to, you know not have this happen and try to see if you can keep it afloat. But I think they're going to file. The other thing I think is going to happen for, uh, Brian said, and I'm gonna, now I'm going to answer some questions about it. Uh, Brian said, what did Brian say? And then it moved. Brian asked, I don't know where it jumped, Brian. I, I apologize. But Brian's uh, message or comment was, what's going to happen to Musician's Friend? And that's a great uh, co uh, question to ask. Uh, so if you're not aware of the fact, Guitar Center does own Musician's Friend and Music and Arts. You have to understand, a year ago, and I said this a couple weeks ago when we talked about 
uh, 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 what do you say? Oh, uh, when I talked about the uh, the bankruptcy before, I said that I had changed my opinion in uh, just a few weeks ago. It was like a couple weeks ago when we talked about it versus a year ago when we talked about it because things have changed like COVID. You got to understand music and arts used to be a performing business for Guitar Center. I don't know if it is or isn't right now. My guess is it is not a performing business for them because you have to understand music and arts arm of the Guitar Center uh, business model does band orchestra rentals as a heavy and lessons heavy. Nothing in the music industry probably has been hurt more than those two sectors, the lesson business and the band orchestra uh, business. Uh, it's hard and almost impossible to social distance a band orchestra together, uh, a band orchestra together. It's obviously they don't want kids spitting into trumpets and stuff during COVID. So, um, And it could be 18 months before that's a reality for that type of business to see some recovery from all this. And so if I was Guitar Center right now, it would suck because... You have this musician's friend arm and who would want to buy that knowing that they can't be profitable for at least a year, year and a half, or at least until the COVID thing settled and who knows when that's going to happen. So uh, the musician, uh, music and art side, I don't know if, if I was going to guess and I'm just throwing guesses, uh, uh, I'd say they would normally sell it, but if, you know, if they don't have to, it'd be smarter, I think, to save it or hold it until it can be profitable again or be at least something that a company would be willing to buy. Right now, they would probably have to close it because, again, who would want to buy? I don't know about you guys. I don't know what business would want to buy a business that basically isn't going to show any profit or life for a year, a year and a half, possibly. Um, and that ties in. Uh, so T Tampa Blue says, how is Sam Ash doing? And uh, the business. And uh, so what I want to tell you is I I've talked to Sammy Ash. And you guys know he's been on this channel. Um, of course, you know, he's a... He's, uh, He's been really kind to uh, this channel many times. And so, of course, I was concerned about them as a business. I, I've told you guys many, many times I frequent three major online. The online major dealers I, I like are AMS, Sweetwater, and Sam Ash. Uh, very clear about that. That's who I give my money to. If it's not a small mom and pop, that's who I give my money to as a big entity. And Sam Ash is one of those. Uh, Sammy and, and Sam Ash is doing good. They're doing really good. They've basically been killing it in certain categories. Um, like the high-end guitar market, uh, PA sales are actually doing really well. He's doing really, really well. And of course, the only drawback is, of course, they've been dealing with COVID because of their stores, which is, you know, troublesome. Um, but uh, one thing I want to I want to say, like I said, I try to keep many conversations like that very private because, of course, they're they're friends of mine. And and but in this case, I think there's certain information I'm, I'm OK with sharing. One thing I want to definitely share with you that was privately discussed with Sammy was that, you know, his first thing is he wants to take care of his employees. And I thought that was really cool. Um, but, yeah, they seem to be doing really well. They seem to be doing well. Obviously, uh, he even mentioned the band orchestra side is a mess. I don't, I said mess. He didn't say mess. It just says it's it's a trouble. Some, but overall, the company is healthy and doing well. Guitar Center is not doing bad because of COVID. Let's be clear. Sam Ash, all these other businesses are doing well. There's some spikes in sales, as we know, they're doing well. If anything, COVID probably helped Guitar Center with sales more than anything else. But Guitar Center is... Um, it had its problems from many years ago. Like I said, this is a subject that keeps coming up on this channel, and it was a subject 20 years ago. So uh, there you go. The reason I wanted to share with you today was, one, the announcement was made today that they're going to be tr possibly filing as soon as this weekend, and filing, and they're going after a Chapter 11, which is a reorganization because they want to work with their creditors to stay afloat. And uh, also, I thought it'd be fair to share with you some concerns that I have personally. These are concerns that I have and I'm sharing with you. Um, now, Manny says, uh, what about Musician's Friend? Now, Musician's Friend is another interesting thing. And I'm not going to I'm not going to tell you I'm very versed in Musician's Friend. I'm not. Uh, so I don't have a speculation about that. Um, I personally think uh, I th and I want to give credit. Maybe it was Brad, uh, the guitologist, had said this. Or it could have been Casino Guitars. I mentioned their two videos to so check them out. They had both, or I think they both mentioned, I've always thought the Musician's Friend thing was strange. What I mean by that was when Guitar Center bought Musician's Friend, we all understood that because Musician's Friend had a great online catalog. That's right, kids. They were an online catalog. There wasn't even really a website. It was an online, it was catalog. It was really pushing a catalog and then online to overtook the catalog. Um, but realistically, Guitar Center as a brand, I think, is more well-known than Musician's Friend. So having the Musician's Friend website and the Guitar Center website has never made sense to me. Why divide up? I think the logic before was 
whether you went to either side, they won. But in today's market where Sweetwater, AMS, you know, uh, which is also Z Zounds uh, and uh, Sam Ash and all these guys are out there uh, and Reverb, I wouldn't, if I was a business, I'd want, I'd want all my customers going to one place so I can continually post that message, Guitar Center, Guitar Center, Guitar Center, or maybe Musician's Friend, Musician's Friend. Um, that's a question for you guys, whether or not you guys think the Musician's Friend brand has more strength than Guitar Center. I've personally enjoyed my purchases with Musician's Friend more than Guitar Center. Uh, I've been very upfront with that over the years. However, you know, that being said, I think Guitar Center is a household name. You know it. I mean, if you say Guitar Center, you know what it is. So I don't, I don't really... Um, really have an opinion or an iron in the fire, as they would say, about whether or not what happens to Musician's Friend. My guess is uh, I would be shocked if they keep Musician's Friend. That would be my guess. Again, I'd be shocked. I Like I said, if you want my just my guess out there, let's see. And so far, I've been... Uh, not, I've been pretty good. I'm nailing it so far. So uh, here's my guess. Guitar Center, if they file for Chapter 11 reorganization, they will shut down between 50 to 100 stores. They will probably shuck off the Musician's Friend brand somehow, whether they close it or transfer or sell it. And then Music and Arts will either uh, stay dormant until they can sell it or they'll close it. That would be my guess. You really want to run lean and mean after a bankruptcy. That's the idea, right? Uh, because Guitar Center, like I've said before, this, most of their stores are very profitable. The, the employees will tell you there's traffic. You guys know you go into Guitar Center, they sell stuff. So, um, but that's my guesses on that. There you go. Uh, but again, more importantly, I want to stick to what I said before, which is if I was, if in my my personal, what my personal choice is, I'm not going to uh, have any in-store credit with Guitar Center or any kind of gift cards or any of that stuff uh, until this dust settles because that's just the, the safe bet for you. And again, like I said, I'm not encouraging not uh, patroning uh, Guitar Center at all. Is that what I'm saying? There's nothing wrong with going in there and buying something. If you if you give them some money and you walk out some product, how there's no danger in that. You're fine. Although maybe you might have a, a small situation if you... Well, no. You know what? You're protected. I would imagine if you buy any product unless it's used if you buy product you're still protected by the manufacturer's warranty so just be just be care uh, and that's uh flippity do says so what happens with the uh the manufacturer to my man now he says mf warranty so i don't know if he means musician's friend or manufacturer's warranty so let's just cover those two bases first of all uh, manufacturer warranties are set. So that's fine. As long as you bought for an authorized dealer, it doesn't matter if that dealer is open or closed, you are covered, uh, under the manufacturer's warranties. That's easy. Now, flippity do, if you meant what happens to your musician's friend warranty, like a lot of you guys bought those guitar center service plans and musician's friend service plans. As long as those businesses are in existence, you are fine. However, I would be really shocked, and I mean really shocked, if they shut off, shut down or sold off Musician's Friend if Guitar Center would honor those uh, warranties. I would, uh, I would be very certain that they would run them separate, but I don't know. I don't know, right? Um, one of the things I learned, you know, over my years in, the, in, the indus in this industry, much less the finance industry, which is where I started before this industry, um, there are a lot of things that are always crazy. One of my favorite crazy things I ever happened to me was uh, when I opened my store in 2004, uh, this was, I mean, literally the first week in business. I'll never forget this. I had opened up the store and every store at that time was carrying crate amps. And I liked crate amps, but I was like, I want to carry something different. And I thought, oh, what about Randall? And there wasn't a single Randall dealer in the state of Arizona. So I opened my store and I opened with Randall and I bought in heavy and I got the Randall banners and I got a Randall neon sign. And I was very excited uh, because I was like, in my opinion, I was like, oh, Randall's cool. It's a little cooler than crate and people will come in my store. And the first week I was open, the first customer came in and said, uh, yeah, I bought a Randall, not for me, of course, because I just opened and he's like, and it has uh, a problem and I need warranty. And I, now being a new business entrepreneur, the first thing you do is like, I will take care of you, sir. And I was very happy to get on the phone and tell the Randall guys, I have a customer who has a problem and we're going to take care of him and I'm going to earn his business forever. And I got on the phone and I talked to uh, Randall, my Randall rep, and I'll never forget this. I said, yes, he bought a Randall and a year ago. 
Uh, and it's got a five-year warranty and he has a problem. So what is the process on that? Should I have him ship it to you or should I ship it to you or should we take care of it in the store? How should we fix this customer's problem? And the Randall rep said to me, and I'll never forget it, well, we are the new Randall. We bought Randall from the old Randall that closed and we did not buy any of the warranty rights. So in other words, we're not honoring the old Randall warranties. Now, the reason why I remember that story from 2004 is not because it happened in the first week I was in business <laughs> and not because that was the weirdest and dumbest thing I've ever heard a rep say because I've heard dumber and weirder things from them over the years. The thing I remember was my first week in business, I didn't know what to tell that customer. So I ended up paying $263 to have his amp fixed. And I remember thinking, man, did I pick a crappy industry to start a business into because I hadn't even sold one Randall amp yet and I'm $263 in the hole. Now, uh, I'd love to say that customer bought a Lifeline customer. I don't think I ever saw him again, but that's not the point. <laughs> the point is, uh, yeah, you need to you need to make sure uh, that uh, if, if you do have warranties, I would read the paperwork and make sure they're clear and taken care of because... Um, my experience is, is more times than not, you're not taken care of. Companies like to shuck the blame as fast as they can. So that's how that goes. Now, again, I don't, I'm not here to start any kind of panic or freak out about this. This is not a huge deal. Remember, we, in, in the grand scheme of things, of all the horrible outcomes of Guitar Center, we maybe predicted or talked about. This is one of the better ones, albeit not as good as, hey, they turned it around and they're making tons of money and paying their creditors. That's the best scenario. But a bankruptcy reorganization might be a good thing because Guitar Center has been with this looming debt for so many years. And if they can fix this, maybe if, yeah, they stiff a few creditors or they cut how much the creditors are paid and creditors mean even vendors, if Guitar Center can become lean and mean and healthy again and make money, then maybe there's opportunities for those those vendors to you know make money again with those. But uh, I could tell you a couple of the buddies I talk to that uh, own companies don't plan to work with Guitar Center anymore, or at least they want to get paid up front, which I think will be what happens with Guitar Center for a while. You're going to see leaner stores as they have to pay up front. The only business I think I'm really and may personally concerned about is I think Fender's in deep with those guys. And I think that's going to be a nasty, nasty mess. Uh, if it, uh, if it, unless it, but like I said, Fender has Mars music. You guys don't remember this, but Mars music, uh, maybe some of you do when they filed bankruptcy, they left this industry with hundreds of millions of dollars of debt. So it's, it's happened before kids is so to speak. So again, this, uh, this video is just to talk about the update. That's what happened. It happened at literally like an hour before this live show went on. So it wasn't my intended thing to talk about today, but I figured the article's out there. It just happened. They just made the announcement. I put a link down below and I thought it'd be interesting. But more importantly, since you guys are in the buying guitar mood, as the COVID stats have showed us that everybody's buying guitars, I thought maybe, you know, hopefully if you have any of those gift cards, you might want to use them up. I would if I was you. Um, uh, and Manny, uh, uh, Manny saying Gibson also. Yeah, Gibson also. But uh, Manny, let me explain it to you. And again, again, uh, I'm just guessing. Of course, Gibson has a lot of Epiphone and Gibson in all the guitar centers. But let's let me explain it to you this way. And and I had a uh, can I say a friend? I have a friend. And when he was in, 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 who owns it in, in a guitar company a large guitar company. And he was talking about the debt owed to him by Guitar Center. And I had told him that uh, he just said, hey, because he doesn't know, just because you own a guitar company and you sell to Guitar Center doesn't mean you understand, you know, what's going with the other companies. You'll, I, like I told you guys, a lot of the companies, when I talk to them, they, they know about their company, but not the others. They don't like, they're not, you know, gossip queens trying to figure out what's going on. He said, what do you think Guitar Center owes uh, Fender? And I said, Oh, I don't know, 50 to 100 million dollars. And he's like, I don't think that's possible. And I said, oh, well, here's and this is what I'm going to tell you, Manny. When you think of Fender in a guitar center, here's what I want you to think about. And again, this is all speculation. I could be far off base or I could be dead on. I'm just giving you my best educated guess. That's it. Fender is not Fender. Fender is also Gretsch because it distributes Gretsch to Guitar Center. EVH because it distributes EVH to Guitar Center. Jackson and Charvel, right? I gave two fingers to that one, right? Okay. 
parts. If you walked into Guitar Center, there's a parts department full of Fender parts. Accessories, which is T-shirts and mugs and caps and hats and stuff, right? Squire, which is tons of Squire. Fender, which is everything from acoustics to electrics, high end and low end and amplifiers. So basically, if we're doing some easy math and I'm going to do it right now, it's not so easy because I'm using a calculator. If I was to say there was $150,000 of Fender in each guitar center and there's 300 guitar centers, that's $45 million. And that would be distributed between, like I said, Gretsch, because it all goes FMIC, like I've told you guys before. Look, I was a Fender dealer for 12 years. Uh, when I wrote the check, it goes to FMIC. That's the name on the check, Fender Musical Instrument Corporation. So whether I bought Fender or Squire or Gretsch, I mean, you have to be authorized dealer for all those brands. But when I bought you know, Tacoma, when I bought SDBR, when I bought any specialty brands, Guild, when they own that, uh, you wrote a check to FMIC. It all went to FMIC. So, yeah, I, uh, Manny, you're right. Uh, Gibson's in. I'm sure a lot of companies are in heavy with Guitar Center, but I got to imagine that Fender's the heaviest, not just because Fender's bigger or anything like that. It's just that so many categories for Fender, for Guitar Center to, to load up in. And um, I personally have felt like since Guitar Center's looming debt and hell that they've been in, they've been... I feel strategically <laughs> pulling in those bigger uh, companies like Gibson and Fender to pull in more and more debt with them. That's how I feel. That's how it looks. Like I said, it's it's a no brainer. Uh, just 10 years ago, you'd walk into Guitar Center and you see, oh, lots of Schecter because it sells. Lots of Ibanez because that sells. You know what I mean? Um, the, uh, the, the other day, well, I'll say a week ago, a week ago, I was talking to a buddy and we were actually making fun of a guitar center store. Now, when I say making fun, I'm not, well, I'll tell you why. We were making fun of the fact that in stock, they had six uh, Jackson bases and four Ibanez bases. And we thought, why would they have more Jackson bases than Ibanez bases? You sell more, Ibanez is like one of the top selling bass companies in the world. And we're like, why? Now, normally we'd be like, oh, well, maybe because of COVID, they sold all the Ibanez's they're down to the Jackson's. Or, you know, all these situations. But I was like, you know, what's funny is I bet you it's because they got heavier uh, uh, credit lines with Fender and they can load in more of the Fender product than they can with Hoshino for the Ibanez product. It's possible. It's all possible. It's an interesting, interesting situation. And I'm sure it's going to be unfolding soon. But like I said, and if I was a Guitar Center employee, I hate to do this game, I, uh, but if I was a Guitar Center employee and you're watching this video, uh, just keep in mind, look, um, uh, if you're in a low performing store, that's the only thing I'd be concerned. If I was you, right. If I, if you need the job, if you need a job <laughs> and you have one and you know, your store is not performing, uh, yeah, I would, um, I would, uh, keep options open. But I think if your store is performing, I think I would be, I would feel fine no matter what they tell you. So there you go. Um, it's an interesting, interesting, interesting thing to talk about. Um, let's see. Uh, I want to go to some of your guys' comments about this. And and like I said, if you did a super chat, don't worry, I have it pins. Um, uh, let's see. I'm just anything. Like I said, make sure if you're talking to me, put a question mark first, first so you know I'm the... Um, Walter says Chapman is now selling through AMS now. That's not a shock at all, right? I would imagine Guitar Center wasn't paying Chapman. I don't know. How about this? Here's what I can tell you. I don't have a friend in this industry that owns a guitar pedal amp company or pickup company that isn't owed money from Guitar Center and isn't getting paid. That doesn't mean anything. That's not in itself evidence of anything. But I sometimes I think at like night going, man, it would be really cool if I had one person I know in this industry to be like, hey, Phil, they're paying me. I don't know what everybody else is complaining about. That's not the case I, I've seen. Everybody's like, uh, we all talk about it. We talk about the same thing we, me and you and all we're all talking about right now. We're talking about guitar stuff. That's what I talk about when I talk about companies. You know, Remember, the people that own businesses in the guitar industry, they're into guitars. No one comes in this business because they think it's smart business. <laughs> you come with passion. And then you hope to try to make a living or do successful in it. Um, you know, and I think all of you guys know that. I don't think anybody's shocked by that. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, so these people like to talk about guitars just like you and me. Because they are you and me. Um, let's see. Uh, 
hold on a second. Ah, Ian. Thank you, Ian. Great question. And like I said, guys, this is great. Uh, he says, Ian says, will Guitar Center and Music's friend keep selling products during the bankruptcy? According to the article which is, uh, is that I read, it said that their intent is to continue to do that. Uh, now, back to my experiences with how companies file bankruptcies and do bankruptcies. Uh, yes, they would continue to sell things and everything would act as normal, even if the bankruptcy court denies their request for a chapter 11 reorganization and says, no, you have to close. Okay. Um, and liquidate, um, they would still continue to sell product because the, the goal is to get rid of all the, 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 the product, right. And hey, the difference is, um, and again, I'm not a bankruptcy attorney, but I did, like I said, I did work for a company where I was required to learn about bankruptcy law in all 50 states. So that's where I have some bankruptcy law knowledge. But again, it's not from the legal side. It's just from a, how do you operate finance, as a finance company? How do we operate in each state and adhere to the bankruptcy laws? And that's why I said, let me, let me be very clear. If you got, if you, some of you guys I know are very layman's when it comes to bankruptcy, let me explain something about bankruptcy really, really easy that every, there's no exceptions. When a company or person files for bankruptcy, the second they file, they're under bankruptcy protection, which means no one, no one can collect on them. No one can take anything from them. You can't go like Fender can't go down with some employees and start removing guitars from the store. They can't. The bankruptcy courts take control. The bankruptcy judge is God when it comes to what is going to happen with that person or company. So they're under bankruptcy protection. Um, so everything will be decided then. And then everything after that point is a request. Now, these guys are business people and they're going to hire some really fancy lawyers. And those lawyers are going to calculate the, the things they think the court's going to go for and they'll have a strategy. But they're going to continue to sell product because, like I said, even if it ends in a liquidation, which I don't think it's going to end up in, and it doesn't look like they're, you know, they think it is either. Um, uh, they're going to have to liquidate the stuff anyway. So just the, the plan is to keep making money because the only thing is, my guess is, is that as they sell stuff to us, that money doesn't go in their pockets. It literally goes into bank accounts. You know what I mean? They're not allowed to, to touch it. Um, maybe, uh, no, because all the creditors, nobody can get paid until the, the, like I said, it all gets resolved. Um, <laughs> Some of you guys are smart asses. Okay, uh, Sean Brooks says, can Fender have peaceful protests at guitar stores? You know, normally I wouldn't read comments like that, but it actually made me kind of chuckle, so hopefully it made you guys chuckle too. Um, no, they can't. <laughs> I know you meant it as a joke, but no, under uh, a bankruptcy law, the, the literally the creditors would not uh, be able to uh, contact um, the... Um, uh, and again, uh, it's different laws, different things. I could tell you in, in this case, I don't even, I don't even know if, if Fender or our creditors of any kind can talk to Guitar Center, even in a non-collection meaning, in other words, even to do business that again, it all has to be approved. So, um, uh, let's see. Yeah. <laughs> BC Rich 581 says, that sounds like a painful reading list, 50 states of bankruptcy. So, so you guys know, I usually don't talk about my prior life, right? But as a prior life before I decided, Hey, I'm going to ditch my whole real life of actually, you know, making money and doing things the right way and, and, and get into the guitar business. Um, I used to run a risk management department and I also uh, did telephony, if you guys know what that is. I ran dialer systems and reporting systems. So if you guys know like an Oracle database, I, I'm Oracle certified and done Oracle databases. And also Davox, which is a dialing system. And so what happens when you're in char charge of that stuff, you're in charge of customer service calls, you're in charge of the collection calls, you're in charge of every anything that's coming in and out of the company. For a Fortune 500 finance company, that's what I did. And uh, Yes. So what happens is you have to be versed in the bankruptcy laws because when you set up those systems to call customers or to receive calls from customers, you have to route that stuff correctly because you can get in trouble for, well, and a lot for calling a customer who's in bankruptcy protection or if a customer who calls you who's in bankruptcy protection, if you do not send it to the right place, they can't talk to anyone but the bankruptcy department because you need educated people to understand what the bankruptcy laws are. Again, like I said, it's very, very clear when somebody files from bankruptcy they are under bankruptcy protection and it's uh, got a lot of rules and you got to follow them. So yeah, that's how I'm versed in those. I needed to know what each uh, state uh, would have acceptable, you know what I mean, for us, what we did and how we handled it. Now, again, that was another life, but that information carries over. Um, 
let's see. <laughs> All right, I think we covered that subject. I think we it was I think we beat it to death. But uh, hopefully, like I said, I just want to be clear about it. All right, let's spend the rest of this episode since we talked about computer viruses and bankruptcies. Let's spend it talking about fun stuff. Let's see if there's any. Uh, uh, Chris Good, Good, Goodwin says, I remember when 500 people watching this was a lot. It is a lot. 500 people is a lot. 1,300 people is more. <laughs> you can tell I'm good at math. Uh, uh, yes. You know, it's funny. Uh, I, I'll tell you uh, a funny story. And maybe this is, uh, yeah, I'm going to tell you too because I like it. Um, you know how I figured out the podcast was outperforming the live show? I had two people stop me somewhere and uh, I think I hope I didn't tell this story before, but it happened in, in, in a Target grocery section. I was with my wife and I was, you know, being a, a buffoon husband, trying to find the thing that my wife's telling me to get. And I'm, and I'm doing the thing like, is this what I need? Is that what I need? What am I supposed to get here? And as I'm talking to my wife, who's like 10 feet away and I'm yelling at her. Now, this is pre-COVID. So no, none of this stuff. I wasn't talking about this. I was talking. This woman in a fender hat looks at me really weird. Now, I'm used to that <laughs> because I'm on the YouTube and sometimes people, uh, like I said, I'm not, uh, in this channel is not big enough to be famous. It's just big enough for people to go, how do I know that guy's face? And usually they give you that look like, does that guy owe me money? And <laughs> they just know they know you. And a lot of times it's actually worse because instead of like, hey, you're the guy on YouTube. I don't get that. I get they know me. They don't know how they know me. And most people assume if they know you and can't remember, it's probably bad. So they're like, I think that guy did something to me. You know, <laughs> right? Um, and then you get that weird stink eye. And then I'm like, hey, how's it going? And then then they put it together. Um, but in this case, she was looking at me funny. And I'm like, okay, you know, she probably knows me from the YouTube. She's got a Fender hat on. And all of a sudden she goes, do you have a podcast called Know Your Gear? And I go, I do. And she goes, I never, that. I, this is not how I pictured you to look which I don't know what I think about that, by the way. I was, obviously, it was not a compliment. She's still listening today. I wasn't offended, so don't get upset. I'm just saying that wasn't a compliment because I was like, great. I don't look the way I sound. Um, but I thought it was weird. She had never seen me on YouTube or or even looked. And then that's when I started realizing I had to happen in another place too. Somebody goes, your voice is very familiar. And then somebody goes, you sound like Bill Burr. And I'm like, oh, thanks. I appreciate that. And then they go, no. Oh my God, are you Phil McKnight? And I go, yeah. And they go, oh, from the podcast. So that was kind of a weird thing. All right. This episode is for crap. <laughs> it's not going anywhere that it's supposed to go. Um, uh, 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 vintage Six String says, I'm guessing Ralph isn't watching because there's no thumbs down. No, one thumbs down. Ralph's here. We're good. As you know, uh, Ralph always makes sure to give me one thumbs down. <laughs> uh uh, Manny says, were you ever mistaken for the singer of Smashing Pumpkins? Look, I'm mistaken for every bald guy, quote unquote, but fat bald guy. So it's like, you're like a fatter Smashing Pumpkins, uh, Billy Corgan. You're like a fatter, I call it Fat Chirani. You're like a fatter Joe Cer Cerani. Uh, yeah, it's always like a, a fatter version bald guy, um, which doesn't bug me at, at all. <laughs> that's not, that's not a trigger for me at, at all. Uh, cause you know why both those things are true. So what do I care? Um, let's see. Uh, let's see. Rob Halford. See, I'm like a fatter Rob Halford. We could go all day. You just keep naming bald dudes and I'll be like, I'm like a slight, sometimes I'm a slightly fatter version of that. And sometimes I'm like a fatter version. Depends on how, like Billy Corgan. I used to be a fatter version of Billy Corgan. Now I'm a slightly fatter version than Billy Corgan. Cause he's kind of put on a few. So that's how it works. Um, uh, I don't know what viewer said this to me, but it was, he's, I love it when you guys put, this is not meant to be an insult. That's how, that's how the comment starts. And he says, this is not meant to insult, uh, be an insult. You look like Joe Satrani with a dad bod. And, uh, and then I was like, cool. <laughs> All right. Uh, let's see. Uh, X, X, I don't even know how to say your name, man. It's probably this X is silent in Diva, right? I don't know. X in Diva, Zendiva. Ah, man, I have no idea. I'm sorry. Says Phil, uh, did you ever perform? 
Um, yeah, I used to play, well, you know, when I was younger, I played in some rock bands. They were metal, heavy metal. And uh, then I played bass in a Pentecostal church band. Yeah, like Pentecostal church. Um, in fact, uh, this is absolutely true, so you know. Uh, I used to play bass in a band where um, it was an all-black band, obviously, but me, and I was the bass player. Um, they thought that was funny. The band that is um it didn't really affect me in any way um the only thing is i've said this uh, i've never said this publicly but uh i will tell you this weird thing that uh i know a lot of you when i say that the first thing everybody says is you know do you have videos or footage i have tons of videos and tons of, tons of pictures of when i played in a yes when i used to play all black churches in a pentecostal band yes d trust me there was photos but uh, the thing is, and I'll share them if you guys really want one day, but I hate sharing that part of um, of my time in my life because there was a time, and some of you bald guys are going to relate to this, uh, where before I knew I was bald <laughs> um, and shaved my head, I had that, what I call the rat's nest on your head. You know, it's like, uh, it's like thick here and then it was like really thin on the top. And it, so here's what I hate about it. It's like a picture of me in my late 20s, early 30s, but I look like I'm older then than now. If you saw it, you would think like, how did you get a picture of you in the future? Um, shaving your head is not a great look, but it definitely is better, in my opinion, than when your hair is super thin on top. So all the pictures of me are in these. It just look, I look like a different person. You like you'd like look at it and you guys would go not laugh because of the, the hairdo. Maybe mostly you laugh because you're like, that doesn't look like you. <laughs> so, um, yeah, yeah. Me in a dress shirt and a tie playing bass in a Pentecostal band. Yeah. So there you go. Uh, yeah. F Frank said slapping that Jesus bass. Yeah. Um, so there you go. <laughs> uh, so there you go. There you go. Yes. Uh, so yeah, I've performed. And of course I've performed many times. I, uh, just in the last, well, before COVID, I, last year, I think I performed, uh, 11 times, almost once a month, uh, in front of, you know, everything from large audiences to small played with, uh, Larry Mitchell. I played bass with him last year. That was great. So there you go. Um, yeah. <laughs> All right. This is just, this episode, I don't know what this is. This is just gone awry. Um, <laughs> all right. Um, uh, DG, DDG8795 says, Phil, I play in a Pentecostal uh, church band through a PRS Tremonti in a Crank Crankenstein. Yeah, yeah, of course. You know, here's the deal. Um, I will tell you this again. I try to always stay away from uh, religion and politics, so that's not what we're talking about today. What we're going to talk about that, that's important to me is um, bass. playing bass in Pentecostal music is amazing. Let, so you guys know, Larry Graham invented slap bass. I know you're on most of your guitar players probably don't know that, but that's absolutely true. So if you want to be, if you want to play slap bass, like I like to play slap bass, uh, man, that's the place to do it. <laughs> so there you go. There you go. I got... Like I said, positive and negative uh, things about say about every experience, and that was a positive thing. Um, let's see. Uh, okay, so I got I got to hit some super chats. Let's do this. The, uh, you guys have some super chats set aside for me. Let's uh, hit that. I have no concept of time because I started so late. Let's refresh this screen. I'm just happy my computer is not crashing. Although I think I cleared the virus. Um, so you guys know, I learned something. I told you guys I'm not hugely a computer nerd. A lot, a lot of you guys are. And I mean that as a compliment. And you're going to just shake your head at this. So my daughter is homeschooling now. There's computers in every room in the house going 24 hours a day. It's been a nightmare. As you guys know, we had internet problems forever. And that all got resolved. And apparently my daughter's computer got a virus and apparently the virus goes through the, uh, the internet. No, it goes through the Wi-Fi, and got into my computer. Yeah. So, uh, there you go. Like, I can now, not only got to worry about, you know, not 
You're not getting sick outside. You got to worry about viruses inside. It's just, uh, it's nice. Okay. So Punk Ash, hey, Punk Ash says, heading to work. I'll be watching tomorrow. Thank you for everything. All right, Punk Ash for $24.99. That's a huge super chat. Thank you for that. I'm going to give you my joke. This is tomorrow. You're watching this right now, but it's tomorrow. No, thank you, uh, Punk Ash. You guys are great. Thank you for supporting the channel so much. Um, so I uh, hope you hope you have a quick day at work and enjoying right now when you're watching this when it's Saturday in the future. Chris says new guitar day, classic vibe, 50 Strat from Indonesia, white blonde. Uh, so it's a white blonde guitar. Uh, it's a tra like so it's a white, but you can see the wood through it. Three hundred twenty nine dollars. Best for the price I have seen. Fretboard edges are rolled and feel smooth. Love it. Yeah, my my personal experience with like classic vibes and uh, and what's the other series? It's classic vibe and there's the other one. Modern something from Fender are always been fantastic. Um, you know, so yeah. And I personally think Indonesia guitars now are just killing it. Every time I pick up a guitar and I'm impressed, it's coming out of Indonesia uh, to the point where I'm like, uh, better than Korea, better than, than America, better than uh, Japan. You know what I mean? I mean, everybody still makes a good guitar just because one guitar is good. I shouldn't say better, right? Then maybe that's the problem. Tr you trigger people when you're like, it's better. And they're like, it's not better than Japan. On par then. It's on par. That stuff is just great. Um, I can see why everyone is running to Indonesia. Uh, to get to get stuff made because it's coming out great. Uh, I'm 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 just always impressed with the price points that I'm seeing from there. Uh, Jeff Parker says, ever used or installed an EVH detuna? Oh, many many times. <laughs> Is it worth it? Uh, work well? Yeah, I play live. Would uh, save hauling another guitar as I use primary Floyd's. Okay, so there is a uh, product called a Tone Vice uh, product. I think this was, it's like, it's another product like that. Uh, the, the owner of that company gave me a couple and I have been unable to install one. Uh, I've tried twice and it just didn't go well. And I don't know what I'm doing wrong. I watched his video. I don't know why I'm not having uh, success with it, but, uh, but that's another product to check out. Like I said, I'm hoping to get that worked out. Detuna wise. Yeah. If you have a Floyd Rose, that's the only way to go is the Detuna. Um, you just have to understand if you install a detune, a couple things, your bridge can't float. So you got to block it and you have to have room for that thing to clear. So hopefully I will take another swig, swig. I'll take another swig of this fine vodka. It's water folks. Okay. So anyways, um, uh, hopefully I will take another swing this week. Uh, now that I ha uh, can in the shop and literally try to get that product worked out and hopefully it will be better than the detuna because there's some things I don't like about the detuna. It's more of a, it's what we have and it works thing. Randy Crook says, Hey, Phil, do you, whoop, do you, wait, you do. Oh, I don't know what I'm saying. Randy said, Hey, Phil, you do a, you do a get show. Great. He means great. That's why I'm having trouble. He says, you do a great show. I, he said, get, but I'm going to say great. Thank you. Uh, I just got a Fender American Performer telly with a humbucker at the neck. I like the Fender American Performer stuff. I, obviously, I'm a Fender fan. Uh, you know, I, when, when I pick up my guitars, I love Fenders. Uh, made in Mexico is made in America. I just like Fenders. It's a great thing. I like Squires. I like Fenders. <laughs> I just like them. Uh, I think I've said this many times. Uh, now Nathan's guitar is grandfathered in. Bam, that guitar. If I was going to get rid of all the guitars, which would be very sad, uh, and only keep one, it would now would be Nathan's because he, you know, he made that guitar for me. But if it was going to be two, it'd be Nathan's guitar and some Strat. Just pick one. I always tell my wife, if there's a fire, just grab a Strat. But now she's got to grab Nathan's guitar. I hope she doesn't get hurt. Maybe I should tell her to stop grabbing guitars and just get out of the house. I'm not sure. Sometimes. Uh, Sometimes I don't think before I talk. All right. Um, let me let me hit two more real quick. Uh, this one's from Mike. Mike says, do you know anything about Roberto Venn's School of Luthery? I do. They are right in Scottsdale, Arizona, like you pointed out. Thinking of going, but would have to move from uh, uh, Missouri. Is that Missouri? Am I? Am I, am I is Mississippi. Am I is Missouri. Uh, is the school legit? Um, here's what I can tell you about Roberto Venn. First of all, uh, I have a good buddy named Joe. Uh, he is, um, the guitar tech, uh, for the Allman brothers. And he also works, uh, at Roberto Venn and he, he is, uh, great. 
And uh, I have been to Riverbend twice, you know, checking out things. Uh, we were supposed to do something, I think, this month or next month. I don't know. COVID's been kind of a mess. Otherwise, I would have done more projects with them to help them kind of spread the word about Roberto Vin. So here's what I got to say about Roberto Vin. I think if you go there, you're going to get great, great, great training. Let's be very clear. There are a lot of really amazing uh, luthiers who have successful businesses in this industry that went to Roberto Vin. Um, the only thing I have that negative to say about Roberto Vin actually doesn't deal with them. It has to deal with sometimes the graduates of Roberto Vin. Going there, you will learn a lot. You will be definitely better than the average person who's tried to figure it out on there along the way. Let me tell you, all the things I've learned in the long journey I had to do to learn it, I could have learned it a lot faster if I just went there. But when you graduate, I usually get frustrated when I'm dealing with people who graduate there and they're like, I am a luthier and I have a certificate. And I'm like, good for you. Go sweep that up. <laughs> so what I mean by that is uh, it, I think if you can leave there knowing that you learned a lot, you're very capable and don't have an ego, I think you'll be very successful. Um, sometimes I've interviewed people to help and uh, and they just drive me nuts because they're like, I'm a luthier. And I'm like, yeah, well, you went to school. You still got a lot to learn. You know what I mean? So uh, that being said, I, I got nothing but good things to say. It's a it's a good chunk of change. Um, and if it's your passion, I uh I can't name a better luthier school in the United States that I would prefer. How about that? So that's a good uh, recommendation. A whole by, by the way, I see. Un, hold on a second. Uh, look at that. Unfreaking Believo said, uh, Roberto Venn is in Phoenix. And yes, they are legit. And I just made you a a moderator. I remember we talked about that. So you get a wrench. Uh, and yeah, uh, in fact, I unfreaking believable. Uh, and I were at the amp building class together at Roberto Venn. So very cool. Like I said, uh, lots of good things. I would check it. I would, you know what I would tell you is for that kind of money, uh, if you're that concerned about it, you can always fly down. This is the what time to be here, man. Where you're at, you come here, it's 72 degrees. It's a high. It's freaking great. This is, you come here. If you come to Arizona in November, December, and January, you'll be dumb enough to want to think you want to live here. <laughs> <laughs> people come here when it's snowing and it's so horrible where you're at and it's beautiful here. And you're like, I don't know. I live here until about the mid June. And then you're like, I know why I don't want to live here. So yeah, I, you could come check it out. Like I said, great school. Uh, Andy Johns, not Andy James. That would be cool. Andy Johns though. You're just as cool. Uh, it says I've been waiting for Sweetwater to get PRS S2 McCarty 594s in stock. Very few on Reverb 2 is PRS making more core or in instead of S2 in COVID era. Well, PRS was closed for two full months. I think they were short two full months by like a couple days, but two full months. So two full months, no guitars were being made. And yeah, that put a backlog on them uh, is, is the understatement. And they've been working. And then of course, when they came back from COVID, they were on restricted shifts, restri restricted, uh, circumstances, social distancing. They've been adhering to every, uh, policy, uh, to protect their employees. So, uh, yes, PRS is not making, uh, the product as fast as, uh, they normally are, but they're making as fast as they can. Trust me, they're, they're hustling, uh, to make as much stuff as possible. So, um, to answer your question, uh, here's what I could tell you about the, that situation, the 594, uh, S2s and stuff. If you want one and they're not in stock, uh, just be aware that they're catching up and eventually they will catch up. Everybody will catch up. So, um, it sucks to have to wait. If you find a deal, go for it. If you don't, it's up to you if you want to pay more, but I wouldn't. I'd wait. Like I said, it's not going to get worse. Uh, it'll, um, it'll get better, uh, for production wise. Cause, uh, uh, well, at least I feel that way. I feel like eventually demand will taper down a little bit and production and course will continue to increase and we'll get back to a more sane situation with that. That being said, I should point out now that, um, I feel horrible. Like I said, I have answered almost no emails this week or messages are not even texts. I can't even, I, I literally finishing so many projects right now. It's been a nightmare. Um, and this is important. And, uh, TJ, uh, who owns guitar crate. You guys know I've done an unboxing guitar crate. They make a, uh, he reached out to me. I, I feel bad. TJ, if you're watching this dude, please take my apology. I know you sent me a text and it's so easy. I could just send, I, I, I should learn from my kids and just send people an emoji back like a thumbs up. <laughs> but I don't even do that. I apologize. Uh, he wanted to, uh, tell me, uh, and us 
Uh, last week we talked about elixirs and not being able to find elixir strings. And I said, well, maybe it's because they buy their strings from other manufacturers and those fact manufacturers are closed. And he basically said, because he's an elixir dealer, that elixir is let, letting people know that they're having trouble getting the actual chemical. I just want to make sure. The coding material. That's what we'll call it. The coding material. And... Um, and so basically, he went into more detail, but again, I, I don't want to share everything. I just want to share the important part to you guys. So basically, that's the hardship on uh, Elixir strings right now. They're having trouble getting the coating material to coat the strings. So, and it doesn't look like it's going to get any better anytime soon is from what he's kind of explaining. It's so difficult to get Elixir strings. So what I did is I put some links down below in the description to Reverb and to Sweetwater because I checked and they have them in stock. Those are affiliate links, which means if you buy some strings, uh, we get like, I don't know, 1% or something. But hey, it doesn't matter. We get something kickback. It doesn't cost you anything. But I'm not telling you to buy Elixir strings. What I'm telling you is if you love Elixir strings, like we talked about last week, I got a feeling that is going to get a little, each month it's going to get harder to find some. So maybe it's probably worth buying two or three packs. I'm not saying please don't buy 10 packs and try to stock up for the next year. Maybe that's what's going to happen. I don't think so. But I got the feeling that, uh, you know, if I was an Elixir fan, I'll just, again, I always like telling you what I would do. If I was an Elixir fan right now, I would buy two or three packs for, uh, you know, if I had a few guitars, just a couple packs, put them away. You know, what's 30 to 50 bucks, put that stuff away and, and have it uh, so you don't have to, uh, you know. Try a different brand if you don't want to. <laughs> so actually, you know, you know what? I should be, I try to always be super honest with you guys. If I was an Elixir fan, I would just buy another brand right now. But I know you guys are diehard Elixir fans. And so if you are, I just put some links where I found them. And uh, and there you go. So, or buy them wherever you trusted find a source. But, um, but uh, yeah, uh, Topher is saying Elixir made by Gore. Yeah, it's like Gore Chemical, like Gore-Tex. You know, Gore-Tex clothes? I believe it's the same company. So anyways, it doesn't matter. What matters is, is like I said, uh, it, it seems like what I got from the information I got was that whatever's happening to Elixir right now isn't over. That's what I was trying to basically say to you guys is that uh, it doesn't look like, okay, they've caught up. Now the strings are catching up and they're going to come out there. It looks like the problem still exists. So just be aware of that. Again, just sharing information with you guys. So, because you guys are watching this show, I figured you're ahead of the people who didn't watch it and that love Elixir and have no idea. So in two months when they can't find a pack and people are scalping them on Reverb for $36 a pack because they're horrible people, that's what's going on. All right, what else do we got? We got so much stuff to talk about still. Um, sax Squatch. Sack Squatch, like when the next, like a sax, sex Squatch says, I'm, I'm picturing you as a very tall saxophone player right now or a very hairy saxophone player. Very possible. Anyway, it says, hey, Phil, wondering in your opinion, uh, Sire S7. So Sire is uh, the Marcus Miller brand S7 versus Ibanez. I, I have not reached out to them yet. Uh, that is going to happen. Uh, like I said, I had to get past this week. I literally could not spend time on the computers this week. I had to physically work. Uh, 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 like I said, I'm renovating and that's kind of an, uh, I'm just renovating my little shop, uh, that I have downstairs so that I can film more content there, which means renovating means I'm having it set up so I can have it temperature controlled, uh, quietly so that the cameras can roll. So, um, but that project in itself, uh, like all projects ended up, uh, 10,000 times harder than it was supposed to be. So there you go. Uh, let's see. It says, uh, he says, uh, seems like the sire is a slam dunk at that price. Thanks for a ton of everything. Yeah. Like I said, I, I would be interested in checking one out, uh, and, and, uh, giving you some opinions and comparing it and stuff. Like I said, it looks cool. Uh, I'll, I'll reach out to them. Maybe they're interested in a video. You know what I mean? You never know. You never know. But uh, like I said, I've tried the bases and the bases were cool. Uh, Mitchell says, what are the differences in the Wolfgang series between standard special signatures, etc., and do the Floyds stay in tune? Uh, well, the Floyds generally stay in tune. You know what I mean? I mean, it's not. Uh, here's the deal. The, the Wolfgang guitars are all blocked, which means the Floyds go against the body. It's very hard to find a Floyd Rose that's literally blocked, not floating, that doesn't stay in tune. 
Um, even the inexpensive ones will stay in tune. In fact, so you know, when people have like really inexpensive, like $100, $100 $200 inexpensive Floyd Rose guitars, the first thing I usually want to do is block them because, you know, going forward, they're usually great. It's just, you know, trying to keep them floating is a little messy when they get that inexpensive. Um, and the Wolfgang series, uh, yeah. The differences are obviously in a lot of things of where they're made. Some are made in Indonesia. Some are made in Mexico. Uh, obviously, some are made in the USA. They have different specifications. Uh, the made in Indonesia ones have flat tops. Uh, what I can tell you from my experience with the Wolfgangs, the EVH series stuff is um, I I like the specials because I like the carved top and I like the way they look. But the, the standards that I've played have been fantastic. I hope I don't have that backwards. I can have that backwards. That, I'll just keep it easy. I like the main Mexico ones because I like the way they look. The Indonesian ones, though, play and sound fantastic. <laughs> so there you go. Grumpy Mike says, I have gas. Well, okay. We know what he means. He's got guitar acquisition syndrome. Acquisition syndrome. Ac no, there's no word acquisition. It's acquisition. Uh, do I want a guitar or an amp and why not? Do you want a guitar or an amp? You want a guitar. Grumpy, that's my guess. You want a guitar. Uh, Alchemy Audio says, <laughs> I know he's like, well, and what else? No, no, I just want a guitar. Alchemy Audio says, hey, Phil, I just want to say thanks for suggesting the Seymour Duncan Custom 5 and the Jazz Humbucker. Awesome. I really love the combo in my Ibanez RG Hartel. So we talked about that uh, before on a podcast. He asked, I'm glad he liked that. That's, that's, that's a great combo. I think you can't go wrong. Custom 5 and a Jazz. Um, especially, like I said, I, I like the JB jazz, JB 59. Sometimes that's just this go-to thing for a lot of people, but a lot of people are just kind of played out with the whole JB 59 set. A lot of players say they hate the way they sound. I don't think that's true. The JB is one of those pickups that's recorded so much and sounds so, in so many recordings and used so many players. I think just, like I said, I like the term played out. Sometimes you're just kind of been there, done that with it. And so that's why the custom five and the jazz is a nice kind of like a different, something fresh. Um, uh, Kevin says he's new to the podcast on YouTube channel. Appreciate what you do. I'm learning a lot. Great. I appreciate you, Kevin. I'm glad you're learning something. Um, uh, and I'm, I'm more importantly, I'm glad you're joining us and hanging out. Ross says, I'm wondering why buy an active bass if you can boost the bass and treble on the amp, uh, why buy overwhelmed bass pickup? when you can use vintage pickup with an overdrive pedal and hotter sound. Sure, of course. I'll give you the expl explanation if it helps. Uh, the whole logic behind the active bass system is to boost the signal before, uh, at the source, right? Just get the signal hot coming out of the bass, right? Does it make sense? Um, and it's more sensitive, right? obviously, when you're boosting that way. Me personally, over the years, I have played both passive and active basses. I've I've jump back and forth and back and forth and come up. I've had, you know, depending on when, when and where in my life you met me and talked to me, I, I would have different opinions. Um, and I used to be an Ampeg guy. I used to play nothing but Ampegs. And when I was an Ampeg guy, for some reason, I was always active, active into Ampeg. That's just the, the way it was. And then I went to SWR and then Eden. And the more I got into more, uh, hi-fi sounding amplifiers amplifiers and that's how i kind of like to me the ampegs got the vintage tone and now the eden stuff it's more hi-fi the more hi-fi amplifiers the less i even care about the preamps uh the active preamps in the bass so um but here's what i will tell you for me if this helps uh again like i said different times in my life i had different answers but here's my answer now my all my bases all of them no exception have an active system and they're you all of them have really an over top over the top active system and the reason now is because i don't even care about bass amps anymore i don't care about anything anymore i just literally want to show up and plug in so uh like uh, we i mentioned larry mitchell earlier i i when i went and played with him uh like i said i brought a little hughes and kinder amp i didn't even need it i could just literally just plug into the p you know to the pa the di box with my bass and just play I don't even need, I, I take an Eden preamp with pedal with me. I don't even need that. My Warwick has a custom preamp built into it. I can just use that. So, and what I like is I control everything with just on the base. So there you go. That's, and it's just a habit now to have control. Um, but that's where I'm at now. In a year, you ask me again, I might be like, oh, I'm all nothing but just standard 63 reissue jazz bases, right? Because you just change all the time. Um, but I prefer, no, I don't say prefer. I like passive systems. 
And all of my preamps on my bases are bypassable. I can just bypass into a, a passive system. But at this point, I just run the bases active and don't even run any amps anymore because I don't have to carry them. That's what it really comes down to. And if it sounds a little better the other way, I don't care because I don't have to carry a bass amp now. <laughs> One thing that's great, I loved having a YouTube channel. It's like I get the, the best of all the worlds. I get to have a YouTube channel talking about guitars and how I like guitars. And then when I play with musicians, I'm a bass player. I literally, as a bass player, my whole goal is to show up with a bass on my back, nothing else, right? Just get out of my truck, walk into the place, plug in my bass, play, and leave. <laughs> no, oh man, I gotta wait for the other bands finish to get my amp behind the stage where they're at. Like, I don't have any of that stuff. I just leave. <laughs> I'm done. So there you go. All right. Uh, so there you go. Uh, Jacob King says, I like active pickups on everything for better signal and noise, uh, out the source. Yeah. Again, there's, uh, there are, there are, uh, what am I trying to say? There are benefits and, uh, to, and drawbacks to everything. Uh, but in the bass world, I don't, I've never found a real drawback to the active system in guitars. I, like I said, I like EMGs and, and Fishman's and stuff, but I, you know, I can't think of a negative, but I'm sure there's a negative out there. I mean, um, let's see. Manny, Manny says, Phil, you can play a pretty good guitar. You know, over the years, I, I sometimes people go, oh, you're better at guitar now. What's funny is over the years, I think actually my guitar player has gotten worse over the years. Uh, especially on the channel. But what I can tell you has changed, and I think it's one of those aha moments if you've been watching the channel for any time. There were times when I would play stuff on the guitar in videos and people go, you're playing that wrong. I get that all the time. And one day, it didn't even occur to me until I was actually looking at an old video. I was playing a Chili Peppers riff on the guitar and it was like, you're playing it wrong, you're playing it wrong. And I realized I'm not playing the guitar player part. I'm playing the bass player part on the guitar because I only knew the fleet part. So a lot of times when I was playing guitar, I was playing my bass riff that I knew on the guitar and trying to fake it through. And, and now I slowly start playing more and more guitar type stuff. So if that helps, I mean, like I said, I love playing guitar. Don't get me wrong. I just, like I said, I, uh, in my life as a musician, I've been a bass player longer than a guitar player. Um, let's see. Lou says, don't forget, just don't forget to unplug if you're changing the battery. What's great for me, buddy, is I don't have to change batteries. My bases all have um, uh, like lithium batteries that uh, charge with a USB port. So there you go. That's the way to go if you can do that. You just charge them up and then there you go. <laughs> um, okay. What else do we got? How are we doing on time? We're doing good because we started so late. All right. Uh, we have Jose. Jose Garcia says, hey, my head rush 108 has gone out on me twice. Uh, what other FRFR would you suggest for a Kemper stage, for my Kemper stage? Um, so I don't know. Um, this is always a tough, tough thing because I'm not, this is not my forte. You know what I mean? When it comes to this stuff, I've tried a bunch of things. I've tried Axe Effects, the Kempers, Head Rush. Uh, and I have found for me, for my life and my, my and what I physically use to make money and live in my environment is on YouTube. I use the HX Stomp. That is what I physically use all the time. I use that product all the time. You guys saw when I went to the cabinet, I made two videos. Both those videos were made with the HX Stomp. Those videos, one has 50,000, one has 130,000 views. Um, that literally, uh, that, that is, uh, it's a tool and it solves a problem for me. The HX Stomp is one of my favorite tools in the industry. Um, I haven't tried the new boss version. I know there's like an Axe FX smaller version. I haven't tried that. Um, uh, mostly because the HX Stomp works. I bought the HX Stomp. Uh, actually, if you guys remember, uh, line six sent me a Helix LT and I just didn't, I didn't need it. I couldn't figure it out. You know what I mean? I, I mean, like literally figured out. I couldn't figure out the application to use in my life. You know, I can review it. That's different. But I try not to just review stuff. I try to show you guys like, here's how I use it and why I use it. And uh, and so what I ended up doing with that was I sold it to a patron and uh, gave him a deal. And uh, and 
and then added like a hundred bucks to what he gave me for it and bought the Helix, uh, H our HX Stomp. And so I bought the HX Stomp and I've been using it ever since. And literally that thing is uh, super practical for me. It solves, like I said, it solves all my problems. Um, there, there you go. So uh, sadly enough, I've kind of settled that's where I'm at. Now I have a more GE 300 light and I got to do a video on that and I'm going to kind of compare it to the Helix and see where I like on those two amps or those two products. But again, that's a review. Other than that, I've had no desire to try other uh, modeling effects, units. Um, and uh, the companies don't send them to me. So, I mean, I have no reason to kind of buy them and check them out. So I'm just not averse in it, buddy. I'm sorry. Um, but that's, there you go. Um, let's see. Uh, hold on. I'm looking for question marks first. Oh, Frank says, don't forget to like the video. All right. Like it. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. We, I want to go to a, So uh, I'm just reading this question because I saw the double question. Rich says, Phil, Rhett Scholl, and Zach were doing their $1,000 rig, guitar amp, and pedals on their uh, Dipped in Tone podcast. What's yours? What's my $1,000 rig? So I'm assuming that you mean I have $1,000 to spend and that's it? What would I pick? Um, and, and to keep things easy and fair, I'll take... Um, Man, it's, I'll, I'll, I'll try to keep it reasonable. Um, I can't, I can, or, I'm looking in my room right now because I'm trying to say, what would I pick from my own, my own product, my own stuff? What would I pick and what I paid for it and try to come up with a thousand dollars? Um, uh, so this is going to be cheating. So cause it's cheating, I'm going to give you my answer and then I'll give you an answer that I think won't upset you guys. So in my stuff that I own, uh, I have a, uh, I have a Mexican Strat that I've done tons of videos with and I'm into that guitar for about three, three fifty, and I have a supersonic 22 that I'm into for about four fifty. So, and that's all I would really need. And of course, like a guitar cable, that's it. I wouldn't even need a pedal. So, uh, those two things under a thousand bucks, that's what I would, I would, ha I would do. So to a answer your question, I would, I guess I would use to buy a supersonic 22 and a, um, a, uh, Mexican Fender Strat. Now that's what I've done. So I physically bought those and that, that's my thousand dollar rig. I bought not even knowing I was doing that. Uh, but if I, you know, if you sent me somewhere and I had to do it with maybe new product, make it easier. Um, and if I was going to go new product, I would definitely go boss Katana for sure. Cause it's, it's I've, I've owned them and I like them. Uh, like I said, I think I can get away with the 50, but maybe the 100, you know, right. And, uh, and then I, same thing, I would probably find myself an HSS, uh, Mexican Strat. And just because I, I really like that guitar. So, and by the way, you can insert your poison anywhere. You know, you can be like, oh, I like the Ibanez RG, you know, 350. And I like this. That's fine. Like I said, I just, uh, I just like Mexican Strats because I like American Strats and they're basically the same to me. So, so that's what I would pick. It's so boring when I say that stuff. I, I So, you know, one thing that happens sometimes when I'm like, a, you know, I'm at some place that happens, a Home Depot, Habit Burger, whatever, and I bump into one of you, the viewers, one of you guys. And one of the things you always ask me, it's a weird, weird thing. Like, hey, uh, how's it? They're like, oh, I like what you do on YouTube. Uh, thank you. And then they go, uh, hey, if you could only have, what's your Desert Island guitar and amp? And I always say, like a Hot Rod Deluxe and a Mexican Strat. And they always look so disappointed. <laughs> So, but that's what it is. Like some kind of product like that would do well. So I'd like to have a sexier answer, like a cool thing. That's probably what I do. Uh, I don't think I'd build a pedal board and stuff. I don't think I'd go that crazy to do that stuff. I mean, I know I could get like a Harley Benton and then like a pedal board and like five pedals and an amp and do that. But I would probably just go uh, basic if I was just going to go that well. Now, uh, if I had to build a pedal board, I know this is like more involved. If I had to build a pedal board... See, the pedal board is where I'm screwed because um, in my pedals that I use, all my pedals, I would have to own them already because, as you guys know, a lot of the pedals I use, I'm looking at them right now, I bought them when you can buy them at affordable prices. Like I said, I love my Purple Plexi by Love Pedals, uh, and um, you know now they're fetching you know two, 300 bucks or you know more, uh, and I bought mine for like one and a quarter, so stuff like that. 
Always cool. Uh, Frank says, what about Harley Benton pedals? Yeah, I mean, essentially pedals, you got to understand, I'm pedals, in my world of pedals and, and is this, and I'm looking, so you know, I'm looking at a pedal board, my, my main pedal board right now. What's on my main pedal board right now? I'm going to describe to you left and right. I have a a uh, Lawrence Petros compressor pedal, and I, I have another pedal in the other room. <laughs> in the other room, I have another pedal board that has a identical setup to it. Uh, and uh, and I have uh, this pedal board is running in my Princeton in here, and my other room it's running into a Princeton. Um, that is a YouTube luxury, by the way. I would not suggest that is a sane course of action, but please understand so you guys don't think I'm crazy. If I stopped doing YouTube tomorrow, I would not have two identical rigs in two identical rooms. The reason I do this is sometimes as much as this looks like a toy store, this is where I work. If I come in this room, even if I try to enjoy this stuff, and if I just picked up like this Charvel and just start playing it uh, today, you know, just for the sake of playing it, within 10 minutes, I'm like, maybe I should get out this, you know, uh, pedal and review it. <laughs> You know what I mean? Or maybe I should learn about this product and, or maybe I should work on my, you know, so you see what I'm saying? I'm right here next to where our work is. So I work. So I like to go in the other room and not work. There's nothing in there for me to do. Um, it's my bedroom. So it's nothing in there to do, but sleep and play guitar. So in that room, I have identical pedal boards. I have in there, I have the Keeley pe uh, compressor in here. I have the Lawrence. Then I have the, um, the, um, I have the, um, uh, Supro uh, Tremolo, and the other room I have a Boss Tremolo. And then I have a uh, JTM Boost, which is by Love Pedals in here. And in the other room, I have a Tube Screamer, the TS9. And then I have the Purple Plexi in here by Love Pedal. And in the other room, I have a Purple Plexi, so I have duplicates of that pedal. And then I have uh, 5150 uh, pedal in this room, and then into a Acid Reflux Delay. And in the other room, I have the... Uh, uh, a BE 100 pedal into a DD three delay. No, I, I, I don't, I have the caverns now I switched to Keeley. So that, that's why. Uh, so I, I don't, I hope that was interesting. <laughs> Felt like it wasn't. Um, but yeah, and they're both just identical boards and that's why I have it. So, so I can, you know, and I have that because in the other room I can play and that's what I enjoy playing. And in here, what happens is when you, when you review stuff, uh, and for those of you that are thinking about doing this reviewing stuff, which a lot of you do, cause we all kind of do it. Um, I have learned that, uh, try to be at home, not physically in your house, try to be at home as much as you can. And what I mean at home is this, if I'm reviewing an amp for a company, I try to grab a guitar that I'm very, very comfortable with a guitar that I know, a guitar that I love, a guitar that I feel connected to. So that way, as I'm demoing the amp and that's something not in my normal, you know, uh, rig, I feel like I'm as connected as much as possible. So if I'm demoing a guitar for a company, I'll use an amp and some pedals that I'm very familiar with. I find this really helps uh, draw in the audience to go, oh, okay, he's getting tones and how is he using this? And, it, and, and, and I like to incorporate the piece of gear I'm reviewing into my normal rig. Uh, so, so that's why. So that's why I have dual uh, rigs in each room is because that's the room I play in and in this room. I, I like the Princeton, as you guys know, and then I like the pedal board to use if I'm demoing a guitar or something like that. So, uh, uh, Bam Mozzie, is it Bam Mozzie or Bam Mozzie? Bam Mozzie says, how are you finding the PRS hollow body two question mark is a review coming soon. Um, it's right down below. Uh, I didn't, I just did a video that comes out Sunday, uh, where I'm reviewing the new, uh, fireball 25 and I'm using, uh, that guitar in it. I didn't specifically do a review of it yet. I, I haven't, I haven't, I haven't figured out how to do the review yet. If that makes any sense. I know it's like a lot of you guys are like, Oh, you just review it. But I, sometimes I like to have a, a concept of how, you know, what I'm talking about, what's going to happen and why. So, um, all I can tell you is this, every friend I have <laughs> that's been to my house, since I bought the hollow body two core has told me they think the PRS S E hollow body sounds better, <laughs> which is not something you should tell your friend after they paid a lot of money for a beautiful core instrument. But I also think I'm happy. I have friends that don't BS me. So there you go. There you go. Dirt, Race, Dirt Racer X said, oh, Engel. Yeah, it's amazing. I know that's like, now you don't need to watch the video. It's amazing. I've had it for a month. It's a thing. Um, so 
Uh, Dirt, Racer, Dirt Racer X says, the Fireball 25 is my dream amp currently. Yeah, then you're going to like my review and how I approached it. I came at it definitely differently than what I saw. Um, a lot of times when I review stuff, when companies like uh, them... Uh, oh, Dirt Racer says, I want to see the Power Soak feature. I to go through that in detail. Uh, a lot of times, like I said, uh, what, what's happening in the last two years with the channel is the companies reach out to like a ton of YouTube channels and they all send them the product and then they do a ton of videos. And then later they come to me. <laughs> it's, it's like nobody wants me to be first because they, uh, I don't want to say nobody, but a lot of companies don't want me to be on the, you know, the rollouts of products because they, you know, they don't know what I'm going to say or what I'm going to do. Uh, and I'm just saying that cause they said that to me. I mean, I wouldn't just, I'm not just throwing guesses out there. A lot of companies are like, Hey, we like your channel, but it's a little hard to figure out where you're at with certain things. So, um, so anyway, so a lot of times the companies send me stuff late, like the Engel fireball, you know, 25. Um, I got it way after everybody else got one and did a video of it. So sometimes what I'll do is I'll watch a few of the videos that are out there. Um, to go, okay, what was covered and what can I add to this? You know, if somebody, I always like to picture in my head because we're all the same. I watch lots of YouTube videos too when I can. I go, I just go, okay, if I watch these three videos, what am I still curious about? Or what can, you know, what would I still be looking for information wise and see if I can go. Um, um, Frank said, better send it to Glenn Fricker first. Yeah, of course. You know, a lot of them, again, there's nothing wrong with them being uh, being sent first. I mean, it's it's definitely how you get the views. You want to be first. Some YouTube channels, so you know, have it a contract that says they have to be first. They have to be the first channel that gets the product if they if you want to review because they know the first one gets, you know, a pro new product. And and uh, there you go. I, I used to care. You know, if I, oh, I want to be first because I want to check it out like everybody else and I want to be like, you know, I want views too. Um, but over time, I, I, I've learned for me personally, me personally, I've learned uh, that uh, the companies don't care what I do when I'm last. And that's okay with me. I don't have to hear anything. Uh, I really have no tolerance for it, which is not a, uh, uh, it's not a good trait. So, you know, uh, I mean, I can literally like, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm fast to, to, to not want to work with a company. So, so if a company's like, Hey, could you send us a, you know, preview of the video before it goes out? I'm like, ah, never mind. Just, <laughs> I don't want to review it. Uh, it's just, you know, cause I, I don't know. It's, you get the idea. I think you guys watching the channel know why. Um, I like to just do what I, I like to just say and think what I want. Um, and so it's, it's a, I get to eat my cake and have it too. When companies literally are willing to send out some products and I get to literally do whatever I want with it. Um, okay. Uh, <laughs> all right. Let me, let me, uh, let me, let me get focused here. Matt Bud says I'm planning, uh, for an eventual exit from guitar collecting in five to 10 years. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, me too. It's called my, when my, when my daughter goes to college and I have to spend everything on that <laughs> and slowly these just turn into tuition payment stuff. Um, uh, uh, there you go. Uh, anyways, <laughs> I'm planning, uh, for an eventual exit from guitar collecting in five, 10 years. That's what he said. Best to move everything gradually starting now or once I'm, when I'm ready. Uh, well, I will tell you this. I'm going to give you the both, uh, the both sides of this that you need to pay attention to. Sure. You should sell the stuff when you can get the most amount of money for it. That's the smart business move. Do that. The problem though is, is if you're not done collecting and you sell guitars, you'll just buy more guitars. That's it. You have to, you have to be ready to stop. You have to be ready. We all think we are. How many of you right now watching, there's a lot of you watching. How many of you watching right now sold two guitars and like, I thinned down the collection. Uh, and I, how, you know how many, you know how many people I hear in a, in a week, much less a day or month, but a week go, Hey, Phil, I sold my blah, 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 my blah, blah, blah. And I picked up this blah, blah, blah. <laughs> right. That's how it is all the time. Um, and I've talked about this sometimes, you know, especially now you sell it on reverb. There's a little money in your PayPal account and you're like, Oh, might as well get something else. So yeah, my advice to you is sell it for the max you can get for the stuff. But if you're not ready to stop collecting, uh, all you're doing is just going to be churning. So you're kidding yourself. Uh, Voodoo Fist says, are you ever going to offer or auction for charity one on one Skype sessions? I'm sure a bunch of us KYG he uh, heads would enjoy getting some tech support and talking gear with you. Just wondering. Uh, Voodoo Fist, what I ended up doing was last month, 
I tested an idea and the idea was uh, with the patrons, the top tier patrons, which are my highest supporters, I said, I, I, I contacted them and said, would you be willing to try something? And what we tried was what I called a clinic in the, in the idea that I may not physically be able to go anywhere for another year. And again, I don't know what to tell you guys, but I don't know what to tell you guys. I, you know what I mean? Uh, I, I mean, there was plans this year, like I said, those restring events, clinics, you know, repair clinics, stuff like that. Mojo Tone had already worked out a deal with me to do some repair type clinics, or at least we were in the talks to have it all done. Uh, Sam Ash would love to have me come back to the stores and do more clinics and stuff. Um, but, you know, this is the world we're in right now. So what I did last month was I experimented with the idea of doing a, on a um, Google Hangouts where you can have up to nine people um, and, uh, hold on a second. I hope this doesn't act up. Okay. Um, uh, anyways, uh, I'm oh, sorry guys. I was getting a message from my software. So anyways, um, what I was going to say was, uh, what we did last month was we did a, uh, a clinic, a guitar repair clinic. So you can have nine people, me and nine people on Google Hangouts. It was done during patron and it was, uh, to, to experiment to see if the idea worked. It did work. So what I did to, to do this is I invested, uh, money into a into my because my shop's downstairs in my garage i have a large garage and i have a section of it that i use for repair i actually remodeled it that's what i was doing um this week we talked about this a little bit last week uh remodeled it and i made it smaller i made my area smaller so it's easier to control because i have to climb it it i have to because it's 118 part of the year here so i gotta have climate uh that isn't uh, uh i don't want to try to say I, air condition it i have to air condition it and heat it in a way mostly air condition it. you don't have to heat here uh air condition it in a way that doesn't make any noise um that was my problem is that um so we did that that's what the the remodel was we also uh set up a rig uh so you guys know i have downstairs uh the black magic camera rig so that we can do like a guitar clinic where you ask me questions and then i can push the little button and it goes to the camera over here where i have the repairs and stuff all of that i've been setting up this week and and it's it's not like a it's gonna happen soon let's talk about it it's being done as we speak. It's physically being built out. Um, the, uh, I would say it's 90% done. It was supposed to be hundred percent done, but as always, as you guys know, when you're doing any kind of stuff like this, there's always a hiccup. N none of the contractors, none of the work I did, we had a problem. Just, we found other issues we got to deal with. Um, that being said, that's the plan. So right now the, the patrons are the, uh, the guinea pigs of that. And then the plan would be to roll that out. I think, so your idea is, uh, of doing that, uh, is, is, uh, that's what I'm working on. I appreciate you uh, doing that. I will let you guys know um, to do that. And then what I would like to do is have a two tier program with that. So, you know, I have two basic, I have two basic tiers on my patrons, the top tier, which would be more of like, so if you're interested in doing something like that, I'll let you guys know, don't go sign up for Patreon right now. I mean, I appreciate anybody supporting with me with Patreon, but um, I don't want anybody to sign up right now thinking it's going to happen tomorrow. It's definitely rolling out like in a week. And again, I got to keep rolling it out. And uh, so, so, there you go. I'm sorry to go so long winded on it, but yeah, uh, great idea. And so obviously we're all thinking the same. Um, Casey says pale moon ebony care. Okay. Pale moon ebony care. Is it normally sealed like maple? Um, or is it open grained and needs oiling? Um, I bought a fender FSR strat and the fender didn't give me any straight answer. Any experience with ebony? Sure. Okay, cool. Uh, all right. Easy enough. Ebony wood care is simple. You can use any product uh, that that you feel safe to use on rosewood on ebony. So I will always say this over and over again. I use two products. And again, I've used them all. I have no like horror stories. I have no stay away from when it comes to most products. I just prefer to use the orange oil from uh, Lizard Spit or I use the fretboard uh, uh, conditioner, uh, the F1 oil from music nomad those are the two products i use i'll probably continue to use those for many many years neither one of those companies are, are sponsoring me in any way in fact uh, i have a video coming out where i'm comparing a bunch of products and i just spent a ton of money with stumac and uh, Sweetwater buying the stuff so i can do a video where no one's involved in any way uh comparing stuff like this 
uh, and it's on its way. It might even get here today. Uh, and that video will come out as soon as I can get the products. Um, so to answer your question, you can use that. The thing about Ebony that you only have, this is the easy part when Ebony. So if you use some fretboard conditioner on Ebony, you're absolutely fine. You just follow the same rules. Put it, I always tell you guys, uh, and I've done videos about this. Put the, I put the product on the cloth, never on the neck. That's my recommendation. <laughs> I say that because sometimes I've done what I just told you not to do, but I, I recommend you just put it on the cloth, wipe it on the fretboard, let it sit for a second, then wipe off the excess. Um, and I say second, you know, just let it soak in. Um, but my point is uh, you can use whatever you use for rosewood, you can use on ebony. I, I, I promise you, you'll be fine. The only thing is you need a lot less of it because ebony is so tight grained and it doesn't really lose moisture like uh like rosewood does and it doesn't get dirty like rosewood does so there you go just use that light and you'll be fine that's it uh so so hopefully that helps um and uh if you want that like i said check out um uh magic magic uh uh f1 oil like i said f1 from from music nomad or uh the orange oil from uh Lizard spit, very, very good products. I recommend them and you'd be, I promise you're, you'll be safe. Put them on a cloth and wipe it on there. You'll be safe. Um, I trust them with every guitar you see behind me. <laughs> so if you have a guitar that looks like any of these or anything close, you're fine. All right. Uh, Scott Miller says, got to see those picks. Oh my goodness. All right, fine. I'll figure out how to do that next week. I'll show you, show you just because, oh my goodness. I'll, I'll, t I'll, sh I'll share a story. Here's a, my, my favorite story. When my wife, remember, I've been married now 22 years. What I didn't mention last week when I was talking about my anniversary, I've been married for 22 years. I have known my wife since I was 13. Uh, so she's we're the same age. So we've been friends since we were 13. We know each other. We weren't high school sweethearts. Um, what, what we, but, but we've been friends for that long. So we've known each other, our parents. I mean, we're, you know, long time. Um, so here's why that's funny. <laughs> I'm going to set this up. If you guys, and a lot of you guys, uh, obviously that watch the channel were obviously customers, of my store for 13 years, you know, my wife, cause she worked, uh, she ran the lesson Academy. So, you know, she's a redhead. So this is why this is funny. I told her one day, this is many years ago. I said, Hey, I'm going to play in this band. And it's like, it's called the gospel gangsters. And, you know, and, uh, the, it's with the singer Stanley Thompson. And we're going to, we're going to play some, some, some music. I, and I didn't tell her because it didn't really matter to me it, to tell her. It didn't occur to me. Actually, not matter. That's not the right word. It didn't occur to tell my wife that I'm playing with a, a, a Pentecostal church band at an all-black church. Now, I'm not uh, exaggerating, okay? Uh, so the reason why I tell you the story is uh, the first time we played at one of the at one of the church functions, which is a very large, large function, uh, my wife showed up, and uh, I'll never forget this. I was standing off to the side, and she came there, and she went up to uh, one of the ushers, and she says, um, "My my husband pl plays the bass," and they went, "Yeah." <laughs> they go, "We know." <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, so anyway, so, uh, yeah, I'll show you pictures. Cause it's always a, it's a, like I said, it was one of the funnest times of my life. And, and I highly recommend this. Like I said, I was in the army. I highly recommend if you haven't had the experience in your life and please take me up on this. I don't care what your uh, ethnicity is, whether you're a man or a woman. Uh, if you ever have the experience in life to, to, um, surround yourself with people that don't look like you or act like you, you should take that opportunity. It was the best experiences of my life were when I was in the army or when I was playing in bands like that to, to, to surround yourself with a culture that's not yours is the best way to f find things that are amazing. So that's just my experience. And I would imagine it will also be you. Uh, so there you go. There you go. Um, all right. Uh, and then, uh, doc, Doc wants to know, hey, hey, howdy, Phil. Wondering if my email got you, uh, and I mean, he means got to me, uh, with the pics of my guitar room. If not, I'll try again. It, it, is it sad uh, that I can't manage an email, but the, but the Marines put me in charge of their medical needs. Well, thank you for your service, and especially uh, for the medical side, because, you know, definitely... Uh, you know, you're the man. Uh, and, and he says, uh, so yes, uh, look, two things that maybe we clear up right now. Cause that's what's nice about having a live show every week. And we could clear out issues. Um, 
If you sent me pictures to your super strats, a couple comments in the video I did this week were like, oh, I guess you didn't use mine. I don't know if it was clear. I'll make sure it's very clear. I was going to do two live shows where we just did a, like a, a you know, like a, a home movies thing where I just showed you the pictures. And I, I really decided to go, no, this will work better if I actually edit and create the, the videos and do them 10 minutes at a time. And then just do a bunch of them. And I want to let you know, just because um, I, I really think that was a, a better way to do it. I'm very happy. I hope you guys really enjoy it because it takes about six to seven hours to make one of those 10 minute videos um, because of so much editing and over talking. You know, I have to read and over talk and overdub. I don't want to say over talk, overdub. And um, so what I'm basically saying is if you send me pictures, you'll eventually be in one of those videos, right? I did try to go in order they came, but then I kind of sorted stuff to keep it interesting. Again, I want to make people interested in the pro and the in the videos, which is the product. The product I make is videos, so I kind of moved some stuff around. But like I said, I'm getting there. So if you send me something, please, like I said, be aware. You'll be in there, I promise. Uh, and if I forget you, well, then I'll have a last video where I recap all the people who sent me emails saying I forgot them. Like I said, we'll we'll be fine. Um, and then uh, as for Doc, uh, as as far as your uh, email, uh, yeah, I'm sure I got it. I've been in a little, like I said. Uh, uh, you know, construction mode. <laughs> so, um, and then, uh, yeah, I'll just tell you. So here's what happened. I, I'm just going to, I got to vent it. So here's what happened with the, the shop. So, you know, everything was fine. I had a contractor come. They did the work. They were amazing. I got nothing but great things to say. I did some of the work myself, as you do, a little sweat equity. I did some stuff. My wife painted for me. She painted. We wanted to change things up. They installed the, uh, you know, they installed some stuff like the door and stuff, the new door. I had a new door put in. The, the garage door, it's a single garage door for the shop. There's a garage door and we insulated it and we did some stuff. And what happened was there was a little micro chip in the window and it cracked. So the window has to be replaced. The 11 by 18 window. We had three garage companies, I think, come out and two glass companies, or at least that's what I think, something like that. Maybe it was two and two. But anyways, they came out. No one can replace this window. This garage door is some mystical crazy garage door even though my house was built in like 2006 they don't make this garage door anymore it apparently went out of business in the recession and the company that makes the garage door and it's a big night and so you know some of you guys are going to make comments no phil this look i already talked to so many companies you can imagine how many times and during COVID, it takes to get people out to your house right now it's a little tricky after uh, literally almost a half dozen of companies all telling the same story, which is they can't replace my $5 window because they don't make the frame and the piece anymore and there's no way to do it. So I, of course, went and bought glass, cut glass myself, try to put it in and realized that they're right. It's very difficult to get this done. Can it be done? Yes. So we have to replace the entire garage door to replace the little window. I'm not complaining. <laughs> I'm just explaining that sucked up an insane amount of time this week. So uh, that's my way of apologizing for not getting to certain emails and doing stuff. That's just, you guys, I, I know a lot of you understand. You all do, do stuff, projects and stuff, and you guys know that's how it goes. So uh, yeah, they, um, and then Richard said, Richard Scott, he says, what about those new amps you teased about? Yeah, they're not out yet. I told you, like I said, I, I have no control. I'm not uh, when they come out. Um, uh, I did, however, watch last week as you guys threw out guesses and, and literally it's a bunch of brands. <laughs> this is, I feel horrible. I'm just tor tormenting you, Richard. I, I apologize that I'm tormenting you, but I, like I said, they'll be cool. Um, uh, let's see. <laughs> All right. Uh, we got to get. We got to get focused. What do we got to do? Hold on a second. Let me drink some water real quick. Um, Derek says, I live in Tucson and I have a guitar. All right. Sounds like a cool t-shirt. Uh, it says, I think you would love to look at it for a Sharpa Max 80s made in Japan uh, Squire Bullet modded out, but needs some work. It's 30 years plus old and needs some TLC. I, I probably would. Sadly enough, uh, Derek, I have, uh, like I said, I'm still working on some Sharpa Max guitars that were ready to get kind of finished. And then I decided I'm going to wait until the shop's done. 
the change of the shop because I like the layout now. It's again, it's not a big deal. Like I said, this is a minor shop change, but it might, you know, you guys know even a minor change is sometimes end up being a big, big, big project. Um, but I'll keep you in mind, buddy. Uh, like I said, you know, there we go. Uh, patient zero says anything new in the seven string market been out of the loop. I got my two Schecters from you years ago, uh, but I'm looking for something new. You know, in the seven string market, I mean, obviously, you know, you got Strandberg. That's pretty out there and cool. You got the new Abbasi guitars. Those are definitely out there and cool. Um, the I'm trying to think what else is cool in the seven string market. It seems like it's been an eight string market for the last few years. You know what I mean? In the, in the grand scheme of things. I... I've owned a ton of seven strings. I love them all. And for one fun reason or another, I, d I dwindle them all down and end up just with my RG7620 made in Japan seven string that I still love. It plays great. Sounds great. I bought it for 350 used. You can't beat that for a made in Japan Ibanez. You know what I mean? Uh, with uh, And their premium line. So um, I don't know. <laughs> like looking around. I don't, know they can, I don't know. Maybe I need to poke around now. Maybe it's time for another seven string video. Miguel says, ever tried the Epiphone Prof series? We talked about this last week and I hadn't tried them. Uh, nice specs on paper. Think they're worth the $8.99 price tag, uh, debating and getting one or not. Uh, I don't know. Like I said, I don't know anything about them. I stopped, like I said, I, I talked to Al John and somebody else at Epiphone, let them know that I was interested in a few models of guitars to do videos with. Uh, it was a very positive conversation. If it comes to fruition and they send some product out, we'll do, I'll do videos, you know what I mean? And it'll be great. If they don't, then maybe I'll stumble across, stumble, stumble across some Epiphones. Um, part of the problem though is, is, you know, it's tough. Like I understand Epiphone has, you know, just like every company, they have some channels they like to work with and they probably work with them. Um, and it's hard for me, like I said, I've said this before, and I always mean this with as much respect as I can give out there. It's hard sometimes to chase companies for product, product because I have so many companies that are trying to send product. You see what I'm saying? It's, it's a really weird world. I, I know sometimes deep down, I think you guys rather see an Epiphone than, you know, another brand. Um, but it's really tough when a company's like, Hey, we like your channel. We'd like to work with you. We'd like to send out a product and have you do a video. And you're like, cool. Meanwhile, you can't get the other company to send you any product. It seems like, you know, it's, it's hard to put energy into chasing something when something's already being presented to you. Again, it kind of re revolves back to Derek. Derek's like, Hey, you want to do a sharp max? It'd be really silly of me to put out a video going, Hey, you got a sharp max. You guys want to send me when I actually have people already trying to request it. So again, it's hard to chase things when you already have things coming. Uh, to you. So that's it. But so, you know, deep down, I tried to present uh, to you guys stuff that I think you're interested in. And I know you guys are definitely interested in Epiphone. A little fun fact for you. Uh, if the Epiphone guys ever watch this video, uh, d uh, we're coming up on uh, 75 million views. We're at 72 and change. So when I say coming up, I mean, it's just eventual. It's going to be there in a month or two. Um, but 75 million views, but we're getting closer to 300,000 subscribers. And so obviously uh, the 250,000, the quarter million subscriber mark, and uh, it was quarter million and I think it was like 50 million views, quarter million subscribers, whatever it was, it happened a few months ago. The problem was COVID happened and we weren't able to do a celebration on the channel. Um, so uh, so I don't wanna lose out on doing the 300,000 subscriber celebration. I don't know what's gonna take place, but I'm preparing for it. And so I obviously started making some content and getting some stuff uh, prepared. And here's what I found out that is interesting, a little interesting fact. I don't know why I did this, but I did it. I took all the pictures. Right now, I currently have over 2,000 pictures of you guys in Know Your Gear shirts. <laughs> That's how many pictures I have because uh, I was going through my folders. And I'm like, wow. And here's what I can tell you. I decided to go through all of them one night. Apparently, I do have some free time that I don't say I have. And I, f I discovered that the – I was curious. I was, like, I was like, oh, I wonder what brand comes up the most. It's Epiphone. More of you have sent pictures of yourselves to Epiphones. By far, there's not even a close second. If I was to take those pictures, the majority of them are, the biggest folder of them uh, is Epiphones, over 700 and something. So just in that one category is Epiphone. So I hear it loud and clear. You guys own a lot of Epiphones, and it would be really cool if I did more Epiphone videos. So... I figured I'm going to give them just a little bit more time since it's November. And if not, then like I said, we'll figure something out. I'll just have to start buying them and reviewing them. So that's just how it works. Because like I said, you obviously guys love Epiphones. I like Epiphone too. I've talked about this many times. 
You know what I mean? I like them too. They're uh, I I'll say it. I'll say it over and over again. I like a lot of guitars, as you can tell. But uh, like a broken record, Mexican strats and Epiphones to me are the heart and soul of like the great affordable cool guitars. You know what I mean? I don't know. Unless of course you're 20 and you think Gent's cool, and then maybe those aren't for you. But there's nothing wrong with that either. All right. Uh, <laughs> okay. Um, hold on a second. Uh, Scott wants to know, what is Scott? Scott wants me to know, hey, Phil, have you ever tried Twisted Pickups uh, for the telly? Uh, thoughts? I've listened to them online, but I was wondering what their real thoughts are. Um, so uh, there's a Twisted Telly uh, Fender pickup. Is that what you're talking about? So I don't know. If there's a brand Twisted, I've never tried them. I don't know anything about them. If you're talking about the Twisted Telly pickup from Fender, uh, I have had them. Uh, they're cool. Um but I, I mean, I, I don't currently have a telly with them in it. <laughs> so there you go. Um, but they're good. I remember liking them when I played them. Um, uh, for telly pickups, I've really kind of, you know, like I said, I always like the uh, the Billy Gibbons uh, Seymour Duncan set for Noiseless. I really like those. And I like the Lindy Fraylin Blue set. Those are the two sets I tend to go to a lot on my tellies. Nathan did a super chat. He said, what'd he say? He said, my custom 24 neck keeps getting sticky in any remedies. Yeah. If you watch the, uh, what a guitar, would a, uh, uh, Fender master builder, uh, pick, uh, what Squire would a, a custom, sorry. It's, it's what Squire would a Fender master builder pick. Uh, that's with Ron Thorne. He talks about how you can get some Maguire's and uh and fix that and it works i absolutely uh, used it and it works uh he gives you uh explanation just get the um the um the stuff without pumice in it so it doesn't scratch the neck just sit there and wax that neck man and it, it literally is gonna feel like like slippery dude it feels great it feels like slippery i don't want to say glass because that kind of feels sticky uh it just feels slippery and awesome so and it will last forever there you go on that note i'm gonna call it I'm going to refresh one more time just to make sure I didn't miss anything. I say, and as we always know, I say, I'm going to call it. And then we do 10 more, but I think we're going to call it. Yep. We're good. We have hand answered all those. Let me see if there's just one last one that we can end with. Uh, and again, if you have question marks first, that helps. Uh, and, and I'll, you know what I'll do? I'll do two. Cause I, I'm notoriously known for not doing what I say when I go, Oh, well, no more. And then, uh, just cause Brian, Hey Brian, Brian Stewart. Uh, he basically asked me this question on Patreon, and I didn't get to it yet. And he said, Hey Phil, what is your favorite flavor of, uh, tube screamer? Uh, it, it can be any brand. I, uh, I am so boring. Like I said, I, I like the tube screamer, the TS nine. I use that. I have the max on 808 as well. I don't know why I don't use the Maxon 808. <laughs> I like the button on it better. The TS9 button sucks. That square button that sometimes when you push it and you can't tell if at an angle, if you can't tell if the light's on. But I used to use the TS9. It's on the pedal board. It's what I'm using. Uh, I have the Maxon 808 and, and that's what I'm paired down to. So I, got, I used to have a bunch. I'm down to two tube screamers when I thin down. Uh, the 808 from Maxon and the Ibanez, those are the two I use. And to be honest with you, I keep thinking about getting the GHS one, the Bonsai and just calling it quits with all that stuff and just using that. But in the meantime, I have those two and, uh, I use the TS nine more than the 808. And then Ross home, by the way, saying I use car polish on my guitars. That's basically what Meguiar's is. It's just, you know, basically the same thing just without pumice, uh, make sure our, you know, just make sure it doesn't have pumice. Um, let's see. Hold on. Um, Shrinkadillo says, do I watch Trogley's Guitar Workshop? I don't know what that is. Is that different than his channel? I thought it was called Trogley's Channel. I thought it was called, right? It's not? I don't know. If that's something new, I haven't checked out. I literally don't get to watch any YouTube anymore. <laughs> uh, co COVID for most, not most people, for some people, COVID has been like, hey, I'm trapped in the house and I got to watch a lot of Netflix and YouTube. Um, for me, uh, I've seen this experience so far with everybody I've talked to COVID is either you're, you're either not working, you know, you're locked down and there's frustration or you're working harder than you ever worked for. I have literally not ever worked this many hours, um, 
like I said, I've hit, I've, like I said, I've hit literally exhaustion so many times. Um, you know what I mean? Uh, yeah. So I don't get, uh, I don't get to do it as much. I don't get to check out the YouTube channels as much. Um, yeah. Somebody says Trogly's guitar show. Yeah. That's what I thought it was called. Trogly's guitar show. I've seen a few. I, I mean, I've talked to Trogly once and he's a very nice guy. Seems very nice. Um, Okay, so on that note, um, I think we'll call it. I think we'll call it. So um, as always, I want to thank you guys so much for hanging out. Thank you guys so much for dealing with the technical difficulties today. Like I said, uh, that was an interesting event. And uh, hopefully we will have a great uh, week this week. We'll talk next Friday, same time, this time, but next time not late. <laughs> <laughs> and uh and uh as always i want to thank you guys so much for your time till the next time know your gear and then i'll uh i'll let you guys go